um, really just your vocabulary and how comfortable you are with different um, varying sentence structures. Um, reading is a big one. So I think that reading is kind of practice for writing and that it gets you comfortable with different structures, setups, um, things like that. So try to read a variety of things. And also, I always encourage people to highlight or underline anytime they see something that really jumps out at them. That's a good way to make notes on um, just different things that you think are really effective. Other things to do, um, there's so many free resources out there on the internet. So make sure that you kind of give yourself a crash course um, on high school English class. Um, of course, install things like the Chrome extension for, for grammar, Grammarly, excuse me. Um, those are really great ways to catch simple mistakes. Um, I also have a couple of resources like the Write Better Right Now ebook, which also has some writing exercises into it. Um, that's a good way to kind of just if you don't want to take the time to look up the, the things that you should know from English class, that's a great place to start. There's some lessons in there on punctuation and um, vocabulary, um, common mistakes that people make, um, like using wrong words and phrases. So that's a good thing to check out. But I think the biggest thing is get a second set of eyes. So yeah, you can use all the tools and software in the world, but the best way you're going to find out how to improve your writing is to get another writer to review it and then to leave comments within the doc so they can kind of show you along the way the notes that they would recommend. So when I first started writing, this was the best way that I learned how to improve. I found a really good editor and asked them to review my pieces before I turned them in. And it was really intimidating when I first started because there'd be so much read and so many notes within the document that I felt super intimidated by the process. But learning and being able to become a better self editor through that person's notes really informed my writing moving forward. So get a second set of eyes if you can get somebody you really trust and respect. Um, that's either, you know, you're paying them to review it or maybe you have like a, a agreement where you return the favor and you you do this for each other. Um, I think that that's a really great way to do that as well. So I hope that that answers your question. Um, the next question here. Um, comes from Ute, who's, or Ute, I'm not sure exactly how you say that, but um, listening after the fact, so I dropped this question in. It says, how does a perfect portfolio look and how do I pitch it to potential clients who haven't worked with me yet? So I think a lot of people in the world of freelancing or writing get stuck on the portfolio concept. And I would say, number one, it needs to be super curated and relevant. So if you're pitching a particular client, the writing samples that you include need to be really relevant to that particular client. Um, subject matter wise, industry wise, if you don't have anything that's really close to on the mark to include your for your portfolio, um, make some like dummy samples. So maybe write a sample blog post, um, do like a teardown where, you know, teardown sounds like a negative thing, but find a site where if you're doing website copy, make suggestions on what you would change on the website copy. Um, do, do some samples that maybe you weren't paid to, to do, um, but that really showcase your skills for that particular type of client. Um, and then curate. So less is more and quality is better than quantity when it comes to a portfolio. Um, so make sure that the things that you're including are your best work that you're most proud of. They're super relevant and there's not too much distraction. There's not too much going on. You really only need to have three or four strong examples because let's be honest, nobody's going to look and do that much digging past three or four samples. So I think that that's kind of the rule of thumb that I would follow. Um, I think the other thing too, is you really need to understand the value proposition, which I've talked a lot about before. Um, so you need to understand what you bring to the working relationship when you pitch somebody, not just, do you know the subject matter? Are you a good fit? Um, but why should they hire you over somebody else? I think that that's a question a lot of people forget to answer when they're pitching. Um, so that takes some homework and some digging to know what, what it is that they're looking for. But if you can speak to their pain points and the ways that you can make your, their life easier as a freelance writer coming into the working relationship, I think that that's an easier sell than just, here's my portfolio, I hope you like it. Um, so try to be a little bit more strategic than just, um, here's my portfolio. Add a little bit of education and value conversation when you pass that resource along. Okay, um, the next question here comes from Dirk. Dirk says, recently saw you switched from MailChimp to ConvertKit as your newsletter platform of choice. Tell us more about the reasons. I was surprised since you co-teach the class with Paul Jarvis, who's a strong advocate of MailChimp. What makes ConvertKit so compelling for you and what has your experience been so far? 
So I did just recently send a newsletter out that really got into detail on this, um, but, but maybe Dirk did not get that newsletter. Um, so I had been on MailChimp for about five years before I switched over to ConvertKit. A um, couple of reasons I made the switch. Number one, I saw Nathan Berry, the founder, speak at SumoCon back in 2016, I think, in Austin, and got to go to a breakout session where he was talking about the company, what they were working on, who they were focused on building this for, and kind of some early results plus future plans. Um, was really impressed with the things that he had to say, got to ask and have him answer some of my questions one-on-one. -on -one. I was just really impressed with the transparency that he really prides the company on still to this day. Um, this model of like teach everything you know, that's kind of something that's informed my business as well with um, just trying to be really education oriented and like sh transparent about things. So I really appreciate that. Um, over the years, MailChimp has also become kind of the jack of all trades, master of none, I feel like. It's still a great tool, but ConvertKit is much more oriented towards somebody like me, who's a freelance writer with some digital products, um, with a regular newsletter, whereas MailChimp is becoming more like mass email marketing automation. And I totally get that. It totally makes sense to expand your audience um, because that's more profitable. Um, but ConvertKit being a little bit more focused to the creator niche felt really relevant to me and just like a better fit. They also had some functionality and tools I had been looking for on MailChimp, but hadn't really discovered just yet. Um, more insights on deliverability reporting, um, like better, easier user interface. That was a huge sticking point for me was that I was, every time they redesigned something on the back end of MailChimp, I would get thrown off and get confused, whereas ConvertKit's pretty no frills, pretty simple, um, but still has a lot of advanced features that I can take advantage of as far as like, automations and, and segmenting people and things like that. So that's great. And it was cheaper. That was the big one. Um, it was cheaper than MailChimp. So can't go wrong. I'm cheap. I like the cheaper option. Okay. Next question is from Javier. Um, he says, what's the number one skill to have to be a successful freelance writer? Really like your emails, by the way. Oh, that makes me so happy. I have to say, it honestly feels like shouting into the void sometimes when I send out an email newsletter. So any positive feedback or negative, I'm open to constructive feedback as well. If it's negative, um, I would love to hear it. So if you get my email in your inbox and you're like, have thoughts about whatever I've written, please respond. I literally am right on the other side and I would love to hear from you. Um, like I said, positive or negative, send it my way. Um, so the number one skill to have to be a successful freelance writer. Um, that's a tough one. I think, honestly, though, I'm, I'm seven years in next month to full-time freelance writing. I think the number one thing is resourcefulness. And so, like, for somebody my age and younger and even older, too, um, I think that that's a quality that is somewhat rare. I think it's easier for people who have kind of grown up with the Internet to have that mentality of, like, if I don't know something, I'll figure it out myself. I'll teach myself. Um, so in every opportunity that I've had freelance career wise, that resourcefulness has kind of been the, the driving force when it comes to success. So if you have a good idea and you have a suggestion, raise your hand and say so. If you're not sure how to do something, um, look it up, figure it out, teach yourself. I think the big thing is to always be able to find solutions to problems. Sometimes that means some creative thinking. Sometimes that means some scrambling. Um, and so for the first couple of years as a freelance writer, I did a lot of scrambling. I did a lot of figuring stuff out through trial and error and made a lot of mistakes. And um, I think that that's the way a lot of people do it. So the resilience and resourcefulness of sticking with it, even when it's not easy all the time, um, that's a huge, huge point of, um, or just a quality that I think is good to have because without it, it can be really frustrating because you want, you want your business to be at a certain point faster or sooner or, um, you want to have more authority and a shorter, I, I get it. You want the speed and you want the, the success overnight. And so, um, that resourcefulness and resilience is what will help you get there, I guess. Okay. Um, next question here. I'm going to take a breather, have a drink. Um, okay. Next question is from Charles who sent me this over email. So I dropped it into the chat. Um, he says, what do you make of the rate equation where you take your desired income and divide it by days, hours, etc.? I see the value of that for sure, 
But when I first encountered it, I had no idea what I was supposed to do or what was realistic. So I think that it's really tough as a freelancer of any kind to try to figure out your income based on time invested because there are so many variables day to day, project wise, assignment wise. Um, that's really, really tough to do. And it's, it's in a way, I think, setting yourself up for failure and disappointment because there's not a lot of predictability. So if you're, if you're setting yourself up for a goal that you can't achieve, it's not always your fault. Um, and, and this was something that I really learned the hard way when I first started freelance writing was um, I had these really big ambitious goals for what I wanted to earn income wise and was still learning a lot. And so that the assignments took longer. And so if I was basing all of my success metrics or income metrics on time, whether it was, you know, days spent on a project or hours spent researching, whatever it was, that number would be really vastly different than it is now. So I think one of the things to keep in mind is that when you are a freelancer, the early days are more difficult because you're learning more. So there's more time built into the projects that you're doing because there are a lot of things you have to learn. Um, but as you go, things become more efficient. You get more processes in place. You build your authority and subject matter expertise so you can work faster and more efficiently um, without penalizing how much you're earning. Um, so I think that that's a really, really tough question to answer well. I would say more realistically, rather than basing it on the time you're investing in work, maybe shoot for like, I want to work 30 hours this week. And however much work I can get done in that 30 hour window, that's the goal. Whatever I made from those projects, it's more based on quality of life and work life balance than did I meet my income goal? Because that's a really slippery slope. And in a career path where there's a lot of opportunity to do less or do more, um, that can really set you up for a workaholic tendency. And I can tell you that firsthand. So um, be, be really leery of the time investment uh, equation when it comes to success or income metrics, because that is a dangerous game. Um, so let me see, I think I need to mark that one second here. Uh, okay, got it. All right, so the next question is from Ashley. She says, for PR professionals, when pitching a freelancer, what's the best way to break through the noise and stand out? So this is a good question and one I get pretty often from people working in the PR field. Um, number one, make sure that you know the writer's area of expertise. Um, you wanna be sure, number one, that you're pitching something that's relevant to their topic, topical area, subject matter area. So for somebody like me, for instance, who for Forbes writes a lot about retail trends, direct to consumer trends, if somebody brought me a story about um, the best new beauty products for 2020, that's not super relevant. There's no real hook there related to the topics that I write about. So I think number one is hyper relevance. Um, a better pitch for me would be something like um, the best 20 new beauty products by founders who have um, taking a new approach to marketing within the D2C space. Much more specific, much more relevant to the specific things that I would write about. Um, so it takes some homework, it takes a little bit of digging to figure out what that particular niche is. But from there, um, number one, make sure you spell the person's name correctly. Um, if somebody spells my na name wrong, which happens all the time, because I have a really difficult name to spell and it feels so duh to get the person's name right. But if the name is spelled wrong, it automatically goes to the trash because I can tell they're just going too fast, not paying attention to detail, don't really know me. Um, but the other tip I have is use Twitter. So if you can build a relationship with somebody on Twitter and go back and forth with them, kind of build up a sense of rapport uh, before making a pitch, they're gonna know who you are. It's a warmer relationship, you've had some back and forth, um, you're not starting from being just a random stranger in their inbox. So use Twitter to your relationship. It's such a great line of direct communication, especially with people in the journalism world um, because they are going to Twitter because it's so news oriented. Um, seek people out there and see who who maybe is a good fit for what you're pitching. And then again, this will give you some great clues as to what they write about, what they're interested in. You can go and do some back and forth conversation. And then when you finally make that ask, it feels a lot more authentic, I guess, is the word I'm going for. So those are my tips for that. Um, Kendra says here, hold on one second. These are great questions, guys. This is fun. Um, Kendra says, 
You've produced so many top ranking pieces of content. What is the best place to learn advanced SEO skills? Okay, so I am not really technically an SEO pro. I have really just learned from some great content managers and editors along the way as far as like how I need to format posts, um, how to realistically work pieces or work keywords into pieces, um, things like that. So I think number one, quality is the biggest thing. So headings and, and keyword integration is all important, but as far as quality scores go, um, for organic search ranking, you really want to produce a super long form, super valuable piece of content more than anything else. I think that that's going to be the bottom line, what's going to get you better search rankings, even if there's a ton of competition or none at all. If your piece is the evergreen piece of content that really answers all the questions about a particular topic or keyword, that's going to be the one that ranks well, not just initially, but for years. So for the pieces that I have done, that rank really well. Um, they're formatted strategically, of course. They are targeting a specific keyword, but they are also extremely thorough. And that's expensive. It's a big time investment, but the return on it and the authority that it builds and the um, SEO juju, I guess, that it generates is definitely a long-term game, but one that can be won. So resources for this, if you're looking for just kind of a crash course in SEO, um, Brendan Hufford has a great resource. I will drop that in the chat here. Um, he has some great kind of crash course on SEO. Put that in the chat right now. Um, so if you're, it's called SEO for the rest of us. If you're looking for some good insights on that, that's a great place to start. Um, also, again, my, my number one tip and a, a way I've learned a lot of things throughout my career so far is just Google it. See what free stuff you can find on SEO. Um, follow the tips there and yeah. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of it. But quality, I think is the, the deal breaker. If you don't have the quality, the length, the evergreen, um, ability for it to be like really relevant for years to come, um, it's gonna be tough to win that game, especially if there's a lot of competition. So, um, yeah, that's the answer for that one. Um, the next question here. Oh, I got that one from Charles. Mark that done. Um, this one's from Millie that she sent to me over email. She says, do you have any suggestions for approach, approaching book reviews? So this came from a longer uh, paragraph that she sent over, but essentially she was talking about how do I write here? I'll just pull it up in my email right now. So I can, I'm sure that I get this right. And this might add some important context for people listening and watching as well. So let me pull that up here one second. Take a breather too. Goodness. Um, okay. So she said, um, I recently read a couple of books that I think my customers would enjoy digital minimalism and the revenge of analog. I'd like to write about them on our blog, but I'm a bit stuck on coming up with a creative way to write about books that isn't just repeating passages from them or giving a kind of general overview that they could as just as well has found on the back cover. Um, so I thought I could start with why I picked up the book and two or three key highlights and things that I learned, but do you have any other suggestions for approaching book reviews? Um, I think the biggest thing to remember with book reviews is um, I think the lessons learned is a great thing, but I, for me, I, I always want, give me, give me an overview of basically the too long didn't read. So what can I hope to learn from this book? Why would it be valuable to me? Um, how long is it going to take for me to read this? I think that that's another important question I would want answered. Um, and maybe like, what are other people saying about it? So I want to know the, the individual's opinion, but like, what are some of the other reviews on it um, related to my interest area? Do I know these people? Do, do I trust their recommendation? Um, is this going to be a worthwhile investment of my time? That's always the question I ask when it comes to um, reading a book is, am I, am I going to like the time I spend reading this? So I think if you can answer those questions, that's a really nice way to not get super in depth, but also be really valuable and succinct and um, give a good preview without, like you said, just, kind of being the book jacket. So we've got that one done. The next one comes from Page Monk. Um, okay, do you talk with small D to C brands a lot these days? How are they doing during the pandemic as a group? Are they still growing or hunkered down? Um, so D to C, the direct to consumer category of retailers 
is large. Um, there are a lot of people and a lot of companies who fit into that category right now. So that's a difficult question to answer with a blanket statement. Um, largely though, I would say they're doing pretty well. Um, they've been really uniquely positioned to succeed in a time where people are ordering online and turning to online shopping more than ever, not wanting to go in store. Um, so the people who have those channels set up and are positioned to really just continue business as usual are doing pretty well, especially those in the home category. Um, that's something that I was just talking with another journalist about the other day is how many people are doing home renovation projects and redecorating. And with winter coming now, they're looking for ways to upgrade their space, knowing that they're going to be spending even more time indoors. Um, so I think that they're doing pretty well. I, I would say that the exception is obviously there are some categories where people are not spending like they used to. Um, I don't think people are buying a lot of like formal wear. Obviously, there's not a lot of events and not a lot, not a lot of like conference travel or formal work travel with all the conferences and events and everything shut down. Um, but yeah, I think that direct to consumer is kind of in a great place right now. I think it's the people who were not direct consumer who are really struggling. So the brick and mortar retailers who don't have the foot traffic that they used to, um, maybe don't have a website set up yet because they didn't feel like it was necessary. Um, those are the folks that are getting hit really hard. And so, yeah, I think, um, again, hard to make a blanket statement and say that they're doing well as a whole, but that's kind of my perspective on what I've seen so far. Um, next question here. I'm not sure who this is from because it's just a little, oh, it's Betty. Hey, Betty. Thanks for coming. Um, so Betty's question is, do you have any tips on getting started as a freelance writer? I write for the member publication at my work and enjoy it so much that I would like to try freelancing on the side. How do I know if my writing is the caliber it needs to be? Do you have any tips on setting prices? Um, I have so many things to say about this and I have so many resources that I've written on it. Um, basically like go back to my blog and read everything you can because there's so much, so much free stuff there. So many good stuff, so many good things there that you can use as a starting point. Um, so number one, I would say if you're not really sure how to start freelancing on the side, it's going to be really important to have some basic structure in place. Um, creative class is a great way to figure that out and navigate that. I'll drop that in the side here. That's the class that I took when I started freelancing that I now co-teach with Paul Jarvis. Um, as far as like processes, um, getting like some templates in place for your business, knowing how to go into conversations um, and like pitch and communicate your value. A lot of that is covered there. Um, the Creative Class podcast has a lot of great free content on all of these things as well. So I would say start with the free stuff obviously, because I don't want you to spend money that you don't want to spend, especially when you're just getting started. Um, but I'm, I'm going to follow up with you after this call because there are a lot of things I could share with you and I, I don't want to get too down in the weeds on this particular question because it is kind of a big question. So if other people are curious about this particular question, please let me know in the chat and I will kind of put you all on one email and send a whole smattering of resources on this. So Hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, so yeah, let me know. Let me know um, if anyone else needs help with that. Um, the next question here again is from, is it, how do you, is it Uti? Is it Uti? Can you give me like a pronunciation in the chat if you're here? U-T-E. I feel so ugly American not knowing how to say that. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to answer it anyways. Um, so she's, she says, what would you like to write in a pitch email to a potential, or what would you write in a, <laughs> I swear I can read. What would you write in a pitch email to a potential client? Are there any standard phrases or do you just introduce yourself and send the portfolio? Okay, a lot of people ask me about cold pitching as a freelance writer. Um, sometimes it's even a warm pitch. Um, I would say it's a difficult thing to do because there isn't that existing relationship. You're just kind of coming out of left field as a stranger, which is a tough sell. It's really, really hard to sell to a stranger or somebody who doesn't really have uh, any sort of relationship or conversation started with you. So number one, um, start on Twitter. That's always my tip. If you're active on Twitter, go back and forth with this person that you want to pitch, study them, find out what they talk about, what they like, what they care about, um, what they're writing about. Use that as your context for the pitch. You could say something like, hey, I saw you tweeted last week about X thing. I really like that. 
Um, I also had an idea that relates to it about X, Y, Z, whatever. So I think that the key thing here is you have to go into these conversations knowing um, how you're going to address the value for them, right? Everybody wants to know what's in it for me. So pitching is very much a, hey, help me type of ask. So when you go into these, you need to think of it of, this isn't about me, this is about how can I help this other person. So maybe think about their pain points and tease out those pain points, whether it's the fact that maybe they need an outsider perspective, maybe they need help because their internal resources are totally tied up and they need to outsource to somebody else. Um, maybe they don't have any fresh ideas and so they, they need something that's out of left field that they haven't thought of. I think the big thing though is not just here's the idea, here's my portfolio, here's who I am. It needs to be, and here's why it matters to you. So don't forget that part of the equation when you put together a pitch. Um, remember, it's not about you. It's how can you serve the other person and really take that service-minded mentality into those conversations of, I think you should work with me and here's why. Here's how I can help you. Here's how I can make your life easier. Here's why this is important to your publication or your blog, whatever it might be. Um, take that mentality into those conversations and I feel like the success rate, at least in my experience, will go up, you know, overnight. You'll, you'll do wonders with that. Um, next question here. This one is from Justine. Justine says, what are the best ways to prove to potential clients that my writing is effective? I don't have access to analytics from things I've written in the past. I've mostly worked as a ghostwriter for agencies, but I've been asked what my proven track record is, and I'm just not sure what the best way to answer this is or to prove myself outside of just providing writing samples. Great question. So number one, from here on out, start implementing an exit strategy or an exit survey with the end of every project. So make it a regular part of your process to ask for those types of metrics. Um, even if you are working in an agency setting, you need some sort of feedback to indicate whether the work you're doing is successful or not. Um, so you can talk about how they were ghost written projects, but I think it's important for you still to have access to that type of information. So be sure to ask for it. Um, if nothing else, get testimonials. So get testimonials from the people that you've worked with. Um, use a testimonial that maybe the client gave to the agency that you're working for and leverage that in those conversations. You need some elements of social proof, even if they're hard, not hard numbers because you don't have access to those. Um, maybe there are external analytics that you can pull. So like, what's the sites that you've written for? Like, what kind of traffic are they generating? Um, if you can get some insight into like, an email list, if you've contributed to a blog and the email list has grown, like how big is the email list now? Um, obviously you can't attribute all of that to your own, but you can talk about how you were part of a collaborative effort that produced those types of results. So it might be a little bit of a stretch, it's not a lie, um, but because you are working with a limited data set, that's a really nice way to get close enough, I guess is a nice way to say it. And then as you go and as you work with more independent um, projects where you can get those numbers yourself, Make sure to ask for those regularly and really highlight the standout features and hard, num hard number results that you get from those projects. Um, and just do that every time and consistently build up your bank of results produced, testimonials, um, other things that just kind of indicate that you, you know what you're doing. The other thing is as well, um, really understand your value proposition. So if you're a subject matter expert within a particular industry or niche, talk about that. Talk about how you're not just starting from scratch on a project, you have some existing knowledge you're gonna pull from when you go into a project. Um, talk about the number of projects you've worked on. Talk about the size of companies that you've worked with, even if it was in a ghostwriting capacity. Um, there are lots of different types of numbers that you can bring into those conversations. But again, I think the bottom line is how, how will you help them? And, and how are you positioned uniquely as an individual to do that well? Um, think about how you can answer those questions. Like I said, even if you don't have the hard numbers, you'll be speaking to the things that they're looking for. So I hope that that's helpful. Next question, another one from Javier. Um, this might just be a question you always get, but when starting in freelance writing, should focusing on one niche be better or have one and then focus on one? Or have more than one and then focus on one? Okay. When I started freelance writing, I took any job that came my way. I literally wrote for um, a heating and cooling agency or a heating and cooling company, um, a medical independent review company, all kinds of different industries, all kinds of different projects. 
And I think that that was wise and that I really figured out what I was good at and what I liked and what I didn't like. So I think that in the beginning, at least for the first six to 12 months, it's totally fine to dip your toes in the water and experiment with a lot of different things. Um, maybe you start to focus a little bit further down the road when you do find what, what area you really like, where you feel like you do the best work, um, and then you start to, to niche in and focus from there. But I think it's really kind of difficult unless you are coming from a background where you have um, a really strong knowledge base to jump in with a niche right off the bat. Um, so don't be afraid to experiment a little bit in the beginning and then from there get a little bit more focused. So I kind of went from general writer to working in the e-commerce world to working with e-commerce platforms to working with e-commerce platforms and the software that integrates with them. So even for me, it's really evolved over time. Um, and I think that that evolution quality is pretty standard for people who, who have a long-term career. So don't be afraid to let it change over the years, but yeah, also don't be afraid to experiment in the beginning either. Um, just so you can kind of figure out like, what are you good at? What do you like doing? What do you not like doing? And once you can answer those questions, um, that's when you can start to get more focused. Um, as far as positioning though, I think if you're gonna have a personal website and um, come into the freelancing world, it is good to start with a general area of focus as far as your outward facing messaging. So that way, it just helps people remember who you are and what you do. It doesn't have to be super focused or super specific, but I think it's good to either focus on one of two things, a type of writing, whether that's sales copy, email marketing, blog writing, whatever it is that you wanna focus on, or an industry area. So like, say you wanna focus on writing for e-commerce companies, whatever that might be. Pick one of those two buckets and lean into either a type of writing or a subject matter area, and then you can get more focused down the road from there. That'll just make it easier for people to understand who you are and what you do. And it'll make those conversations when people ask what you do so much simpler <laughs> because you'll be able to answer the question, um, which I still can't really answer that well, so don't feel bad. Um, the next question here is from Kendra. Um, jumping off of Justine's question, what do you do if or when a client is unhappy with the results of your work? For example, do you offer additional work or a refund? Um, I'm often in a position where a client is looking for immediate results. And I'm trying to explain to them that content marketing is a long game. So that's a good question. I still bump into that a little bit myself. Um, I think upfront education is important. So you need to be clear from the beginning that, like you said, this is a long term game. I cannot guarantee to you that this blog post is going to generate X amount of new leads or anything like that. It just, it doesn't work like that. Um, content in itself is a long game. And I, I totally understand that not everybody gets that. So um, I think number one, um, be, be really transparent about the fact that while you do know your subject matter, you will do a great job. Maybe you do have a great track record of past successes you cannot, you cannot guarantee any sort of results because it's, especially blog content writing is not a super conversion oriented process. It's very much geared towards search engine rankings, towards education, towards authority building. It's not really a huge generator of sales, especially, but even it can be difficult to generate like leads. So like email signups, things like that. I think the, the thing to understand and the thing to really reinforce in those early, early conversations with people is that by working with you and by hiring you, they are playing that long game. They are investing in other efforts outside of just quick ROI um, that are gonna pay off in the long run. So like I said, positioning their website as a place of authority, a go-to source of information for a particular industry, search engine ranking, it's gonna help their pay-per-click efforts if that's something that they're doing, um, quality score as far as their, their website is concerned. You can use it as case studies so if they, they, you know, you can tie in case studies which are a little bit more sales oriented. Um, and you can use it to drive email signups. I think that that's a little bit easier to accomplish than like try our product. I just, people don't really convert that way on blogs. It's more higher in the funnel. So it's a tough thing but I think with a little bit of upfront education and saying like, here's, here's what I can help you with um, right off the bat, um, address that early on rather than waiting till the project is done and saying like, oh, well, you didn't do what we hoped you would do. 
you, you know, you really have to have that understanding right off the bat of, 